Welcome to Wisdom Trek with Gramps. I am Guthrie Chamberlain, and we are on day 2,336 of our trek. The purpose of Wisdom Trek is to create a legacy of wisdom, to seek out discernment and insights, and to boldly grow where few have chosen to grow before. We are continuing the messages I delivered at Putnam Congregational Church over this past year. This is the 10th of an 11 message series covering the letter to the Philippians. This message is titled, The Cure for Anger and Anxiety. I pray that it will be a conduit of learning and encouragement for you. As we continue in the study in Philippians, last week we focused on standing firm without standing still in a message titled, Hanging Tough and Looking Up. Today we are going to begin the last section of Philippians, and this section is called Joy in Resting. And specifically, we're going to focus on how often we fight for peace in our lives when we've already been given the cure for anger and anxiety. Today's scripture passage is Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. It's on page 1829 of your pew Bibles. It says, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. I plead with you, Yudia, and I plead with you, Sinche, to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, I ask you, my true companion, to help these women, since they have contended at my side for the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if there is anything excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Now in Philippians chapter 4, Paul puts on his finishing touches of his symphonic Ode to Joy with a soaring, moving, inspiring conclusion. Some of the most quoted, well-loved verses, passages of scriptures are found here in Philippians chapter 4, as well as a few obscure lines. We also get a sneak peek into some of the personal lives of the Philippian Christians in real-life conflict. In this final chapter, Paul argues that there is joy in resting, and he includes the finest passage on contentment in all of scriptures here in Philippians chapter 4. This contentment is the essence of a joyful living amid a restless world. Whether your cause of unrest is due to disunity with someone else, anxiety, a lack of peace, discontentment, or need. Chapter 4 covers all of this. Paul encourages the believers to find a Christ-centered, spirit-empowered joy in resting in God and in God alone. So often we fight and struggle to find peace and joy within ourselves, and it can only be found in God. It starts out with, stand firm in the Lord. In the New Living Translation, it says, stay true to the Lord. With this command, Paul begins to wrap up his letter to the Philippians. But what does it look like to stand firm in the Lord? What does that really mean? Well, I think Psalm chapter 1, verse 3 describes it pretty well. He says, They are like trees planted along the river bank, bearing fruit each season. Their leaves never wither, and they prosper in all they do. Or we may imagine a believer clad in the armor of God, as Ephesians chapter 6 tells us, to stand firmly against the wiles or the te- strategies of the devil, dodging and deflecting those fiery arrows of temptation. In Philippians chapter 4, though Paul unexpectedly applies this notion of standing firm in the Lord concerning our experiences with anger and anxiety. Do either, any of you deal with anger or anxiety in your lives? I think we all fall prey to that. I think we all struggle with that probably on a daily basis. 
because the former causes an outward conflict and division between other people, while the latter leads us to an inward turmoil of despair. I can't imagine two subjects more relevant for today and more practical than to deal with anger and anxiety in a world of constant fighting, of hand-wringing, Anger and anxiety seem to pervade even into our churches. And our churches should be a flagship of both relational harmony and an inner peace among ourselves. Paul tackles the problem head on in Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 through 9, revealing how we can stand firm in the Lord against anger and anxiety. Standing firm in the Lord precedes relating well with the family of God, fellow believers here within Putnam and the church worldwide. This isn't the first time that Paul mentions this concept, this crucial principle. If you remember back to chapter 1, verse 27, he also wrote, Above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourself in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. Then whether I come to see you again or only hear about you, I will know that you are standing together with one spirit, one purpose, fighting together for the faith, which is the good news. Now, this foundational concept of Paul of standing firm follows the Lord's command, believing his word, embracing his priorities, loving his people, and following his example. Believers who are committed to standing firm in the Lord have less difficulty when it comes to relating well to fellow believers who are also united in, in the Lord. Those who stand firm in the Lord have Christ as their unshakable common ground. His big picture, his overarching plan becomes a shared narrative of our lives together. Narrow-minded opinions and other, other personal preferences, they become silly things when you think about it in light of the unity of standing together in the Lord. Theologian Harry Ironside put it this way, it is always an effort of Satan to hinder the people of God from steadfastly clinging together and presenting a united front to the enemy. Alas, Satan's efforts to introduce dissension so readily succeed because of the flesh in us. So verse 1, Paul says, in the, this way, stand firm in the Lord. But what way is Paul talking about here? Paul must have in mind the next verse he writes, when he's about to say to Yudia and Sinche, two women in the church at Philippi who had unresolved disputes, these two women would aptly apply the principle of standing firm in the Lord, and if they would do so, they would be able to dissolve this dissension that they have. To underscore this, Paul repeats the phrase, in the Lord, to, his, to appeal to these two women. He says, be of the same mind, in verse 2. In other words, if they would apply this general principle to standing firm in the Lord by living in harmony in the Lord, if that was their desire, then their dispute would be settled. Though Paul only briefly mentions Judea and Synthe, we can still draw some conclusions based on observing these. The first conclusion we can draw is they both were members of the same church at Philippi. Now, we don't know what the specific relationship was. Perhaps they were sisters, maybe in-laws. Maybe they were just co-workers together as ministry partners. Maybe they were even a mother and a daughter. In any case, they were sisters in the Lord, members of the same body of Christ. The second, they are in disagreement, which was causing strife and disunity, not only among themselves, but it was spreading to other people in the church. Paul urges them to be of the same mind, and he uses this exact phrase, when he writes Romans chapter 15, verse 5, where he says, live in complete harmony with each other as fitting for followers of Christ Jesus. And also in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11, he says, live in harmony and peace. This doesn't mean that we cease holding our own opinions about things, but it doesn't mean that we hold our opinions so tightly on specific issues that we value those opinions over the value of other people. We don't know what the particular problem was. Paul didn't tell us that was causing this dispute between Yudia and Sinche. But we do know that it could not have been a major doctrinal issue. It must have been something more trite. Because if it was a major doctrinal issue, Paul would have addressed it head on 
and he would have named what the issue was. It wasn't the truth of the resurrection or the deity of Christ or whether we are saved by faith. Whether that was a significant, when, when significant doctrinal issues did arise, Paul didn't hesitate to mention them by name, suggesting that he didn't really think this was an issue that should be dividing these two women. He doesn't even mention what the dis issue or the dispute was. How do we know that? Because Paul sees a need to call out these two women in a letter that was written to the entire church at, Ph at Ph Philippi. But he wanted to mention to these two ladies, get your act together. Start being in unity with another, one another because it's impacting the church. And it can happen at any church. Something minor which started to affect the church. And third, Paul expects both of them to respond positively to his appeal to them. This implies that both were at fault in this situation, this dispute, and each of them needed to take steps toward reconciliation. Notice that Paul uses the same verse twice. He says, I plead with you, Yudia, and I plead with you, Sinche, in verse 2. Both are responsible for this conflict, and they must retune their harsh tone so they can once again sing in harmony with each other. Paul knows them well because they shared in his gospel ministry with him. He seems to confident that they would respond to this appeal to them. He doesn't rebuke them, lecture them, threaten them, or even plead to them, but he pleads for reconciliation. And fourth, Paul calls on, calls on others to help in this reconciliation. Yes, Yudia and Sinche were responsible for humbling themselves and restoring this unity. But sometimes divisions become so deep or long-standing that they just go on and on and require somebody of accountability to step in and say, listen, you two, this isn't that big a deal. We need to get this dispute settled so we can move on in our work for the Lord. And that's what he required or asked for, the objective third party to serve as an arbitrator. In this case, Paul requests that his true companion help these women in verse 3. Now, we don't know who this true companion was. It could have been Epaphroditus who was delivering this letter back to the church at Philippi, or it might have been somebody else, an elder within that congregation, to mediate that reconciliation. Having, pause, having begun on a section, this section on a positive note, in verse 1 he says, You whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown... Paul also ends with an encouraging word in this section. Not only had Yudia and Sinchide shared in Paul's ministry of the gospel of Jesus Christ, he also named a man called Clement. Now, we don't know who Clement was, and he's only mentioned here this one time in the entire New Testament. Now, there was a Clement in the early church that wrote his own letter in the, the book of Clement, it's called but it wasn't included in the gospel narratives or in the, the New Testament, but somebody who was a co-laborer whose names are found in the book of life. He says, not only Clement, but everyone in this church whose names are found in the book of life. Paul no doubt encourages a speedy reconciliation by reminding the disputing parties that they are one in the Lord. And being one in the Lord, they have a common hope, a common hope of eternal life. And we're part of a community of co-workers that were focused on a common goal, just as each one of us are. Each one of us, as believers, have a purpose and a ministry to carry out on our daily lives. And we see in verses 1 through 3, how standing firm in the Lord precedes relating well with others, which is dealing with anger in our lives towards somebody else or something else that we're in the family of God. But verses 4 through 7 now explains how God's standing firm in the Lord also relieves our anxiety. We've reached a point in our society, I'm afraid to say, where worry has become an epidemic, if not an outright pandemic or plague in our life, in our society. Strangely, some seem to treat anxiety as a close friend that they don't want to lose. They excuse it. They make room for it. They accommodate it, and they even coddle it. It reminds me of the old Simon and Garfunkel song, Hello Darkness, My Old Friend. They treat it like a destructive, codependent relationship that eats away their joy every day. Think about what worry does to us. 
When we worry, we become preoccupied by distressing fears, burdened by the past, nervous about the present, and tormented by the future. If we live in this realm of what if, the kind of mental and emotional agitation can't be healthy to us, spiritually, physically, mentally, or emotionally. If you'll turn to your bulletin insert today on the side, it says, The Cure for Anger and Anxiety. It's all about standing firm in the Lord. No wonder Jesus took worldly worry head on in his Sermon on the Mount. If you remember back almost three years now when we went through the series on the Sermon on the Mount, Christ dealt with worry. The Greek term to worry mean is miramaneo. And Christ addressed it five times in his Sermon on the Mount. Verse 25, he says, This is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Verse 27, Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? Verse 28, and why worry about your clothing? Verse 31, so don't worry about these things. And verse 34, so don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Importantly, having name, one's name recorded in that registry of a citizenship in God's heavenly kingdom should give us the hope for tomorrow that we don't need to worry so much about today. It provides us eternal security. Christ promised in the book of Revelation that God will never erase a believer's name from the book of life. And that person is clothed with eternal righteousness as we are. We have eternally secure future. We don't need to worry about today because we know the hope that is going into tomorrow. Now, God doesn't need a literal book to remind him that we are eternally secure. God does not need something to remind him but a book of life is a memorial symbol of permanent security. It's a symbol in our lives that we can relate to this big ledger in heaven where God has all our names written down. Our future blessings are certain, as if God has written our names in a great registry as citizens of God's kingdom. Those who constantly worry find their lives off, off kilter. We're teetering on the break of a break, uh, brink of a breakdown. So to comment the dangerous trajectory that we have when we worry, Paul recenters our focus on Philippians 4, verse 4, as we sang in that song, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. In a letter in which joy is a constant theme, it's no surprise that Paul reiterates it now and discusses the threat of anxiety in our life. By refocusing our joy in the Lord we already began to pour water on the flames of worry. And I have an object lesson for us today. Hopefully it will work. When we worry or are angered at somebody, it becomes like a flame that just eats within us constantly. That flame will get, grow bigger and bigger until it destroys us if we don't quench it with the soothing water of the Holy Spirit. to stifle that anxiety and that anger that we have in our lives. Paul relays three more dimensions of a joyful life in the Lord, which can help us in our anxiety. We all deal with anxiety. Some deal with it more significantly than others, but we all deal with it. Little worries about things in our life. And I've written these in your bulletin insert today. The first one is when we set, let our gentle spirit shine through in our words, our attitudes, and our actions, it will have a transformative effect in our hearts and our minds. The idea here is to have an easygoing temperament. Now, some people have a more easygoing temper that, than others, but all of us can work toward gentleness. Instead of worrying about the small things in our lives and the lives of others, we need to relax. We need to let go. We need to yield to others as needed. We need to extend a bit of grace to brothers and sisters in Christ that irritate us or cause us anxiety. We need to let insignificant things slide a little bit. We need to accept the differences among each other and issues we have with others. Or as my dad used to say to us, 10 kids, when we would be rambunctious, he says, hang loose. Yes, it's not worth getting upset about. 
This kind of gentle spirit will reign on uncontrolled fires of anxiety as our object lesson showed. Second, we need to always bear in mind that the Lord is near. If nothing else, we have a hope for tomorrow. Ezekiel's fine. Don't worry about him. I like to hear him. <laughs> the fact that Christ could step into the world at any moment and take us to be with him forever can give us a hope and a peace in every moment that we have. In another letter, Paul describes Christ's coming in which we will be resurrected and rescue all believers at his return. We read that. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17 last week. And he concludes that passage in verse 18. He says, so encourage each other with these words. Christ is coming back. Could be today, could be a thousand years, 10,000 years. We don't know, but that's not what's important. We know that he will return. And when he does, we'll be all created in immortal bodies to live with him forever. Comfort in Christ's promised return should smother those anxieties fed by fear of the future. And third, another cure for worry is to bring our concerns to God in prayer. Instead of living uptight, tense, uneasy lives, we need to bring everything to God in prayer. By prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, as he says in verse 6. And when he says everything, he means everything. Nothing's too small or too large for to bring to God in prayer. The key is, as verse says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. That's easier said than done. I understand that in my own life, and I'm sure in your life too. If you feel agitated, pray about it. If you feel scared, lift it up to the Lord. If you feel burdened by the past that threatens to come back and haunt you, go to God and ask him to take that haunting past from you. If you get, can't get through a minute of the day without stressing about other loved ones in your life, spend time interceding on their behalf of mentally, emotionally, instead of mentally or emotionally running through these what-if scenarios. We don't know. I could drop dead today. We don't know. I could live for another 50 years. We don't know. Neither do you. So let's not worry and get caught up with that, but bring it to the Lord. When we do these things, when we rejoice in the Lord, when we exhibit gentleness, when we expect Christ's return at any moment, and when we reach out to God in prayer, then God's Spirit will quench those flames of anxiety in your heart and your mind. Verse 7, Paul describes this as a relief as the peace of God. Paul probably had in mind that Jewish concept of shalom. We don't fully understand that concept, so let me read from a theologian, Barry Jones, who brings out the fullness of this concept of shalom in his description. Shalom is often translated in the English Bibles as the word peace, but it means much more than our common conception that this word conveys. Shalom is more than the absence of hostility or an inner sense of personal well-being. The nuances contained in that single Hebrew word requires a cluster of English terms to adequately represent it. In trying to represent it, he uses wholesome, harmony, flourishing, delight, fulfillment. Shalom is the dream of God for a world that is set right, set perfect. No wonder Paul says that God's peace surpasses all understanding and is able to guard your hearts and your minds in Christ. There's no mere, mere absence of anxiety, but a positive presence of God's spirit and comfort and joy. The kind of peace doesn't simply extinguish the flames of anxiety. God's shalom replaces that dry, parched condition that ignites worries with a cool, clear, nourishing stream of water of life. So I say to you, shalom to each of you. Paul discusses how standing firm in the Lord in verse 1, cures that device of anger and anxiety. In place of both interpersonal conflicts and the inner discomfort that we have, God sends his peace, as it says in verse 7. And then in verses 8 and 9, Paul concludes this section with a very simple, practical ways to continue to experience the peace of God. And you say, well, how can I have this peace of God in my life? I'm struggling. A couple things in your bulletin insert. 
First, we need to clean up our thinking by feeding our minds positive thoughts. I tend to be a positive thinking person by nature. And I'll turn any negative thing into something good. And I know not everybody has that same focus or mindset, but we need to take on the positive thoughts that God has listed here in his word. Regardless of our difficulties, disappointments, and heartaches, focusing on minds on things of beauty and virtue will quench those flames of anger and anxiety that would otherwise fuel our fire and eat us and consume us from within. Changing our thinking patterns in the areas will give us greater peace with others and more profound peace in our hearts. Second, we need to focus our attention on excellent models of peace. Whenever the Philippians needed their faith, love, and hope and courage, they could look to Paul for an example. He provided a course to follow. Our focus on one person, on the work, person and work of Christ, can empower by the Holy Spirit to give us that peace and anger and anxiety. Though we don't have Paul around today, God always, always places in our lives observable examples that can help us to grow in our growth and help us in our experiences to experience that peace of God. And that peace of God will fix our minds and our hearts on Christ. Anger and anxiety steal our joy, and it robs us of our peace. They force us to focus on the wrong things, driving us away from a Christ-like life. When we turn our attention to the things that are ex <coughs> excellent and praiseworthy, as verse 8 says, and follow the God examples before us, as verse 9 tells us, we will honestly know and experience what it means to stand firm in the Lord. And we will encounter God's peace. Peace with others, peace within. And that brings us to our application today on the other side of your boat and insert. And this is how do we fight for peace in our lives? Chances are good that you will resonate with one of these roles, these scenarios that Paul's discussion about standing firm in the Lord that were presented today. Maybe you relate to Yudha or Sinche. You're in, a, in the midst of a long-standing conflict with somebody at your home or at work or perhaps in your neighborhood or even in church. Or maybe you're stuck in that awkward position that Paul placed his true companion in, somebody in a position to help others resolve their conflicts. Perhaps you're struggling with nagging worry or uncontrollable anxiety, either caused by an authentic source of stress or by your own obsession to try to control things that are outside of your control. Whatever your present situation is, extend the conflict or internal unrest. Paul gives us some practical examples to, for fighting for peace. Let me share these things with you, three specific areas that we can start doing right now to overcome anxiety and anger, enabling us to restore peace in our relationships, in our heart. The first one is we need to rejoice. Trade in your old upside-down grin and put a smile back on your face. Teach your heart to rejoice again. Laugh more freely. Live lightheartedly. Cultivate a good sense of humor. Something Paula and I try to do is laugh with each other and sometimes laugh at each other. Take God seriously, yes. Take others seriously when it's appropriate. But don't take yourself so seriously. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 22 tells us, a cheerful heart is good medicine. Now, in my life, I've seen very few joyful people who remain in conflict with each other. And rarely do I see somebody rejoicing and fretting, dwelling in that same person for very long. So I say, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Second, we need to relax. We need a healthy dose of gentleness and patience. To put it another way, as my dad says, hang loose. It's not going to be that bad. We'll get through it. Just hang loose. And with 10 kids, he said an awful lot of times. We don't have to respond nastily to every nasty comment somebody makes to us. It's all right to let things slide and just say, it's not worth responding to. We can be easy on people rather than being hard on them. We can relax relaxed in our relationships with our spouse, with our children, with our friends, and even with strangers in our lives. 
if Yudia and Sinche had just relaxed a little bit, they could probably have smoothed out their differences. If we learn to relax amid stressful circumstances, we can enjoy the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. And third, we need to rest. It doesn't mean doing nothing. It means ceasing that mind racing, that heart pounding, that stomach churning activities that keep us in a constant state of, state of anxiety and edginess. Did you notice how dysfunctional our relationships are when we're stressed out, when we're irritated, we just can't seem to have peace? Paul's concept of rest is to fix our hearts and our minds on those positive things in our lives. Yes, we'll all have negative things in our lives, but let's not dwell on those. Let's dwell instead and take a good look at what Paul's sampling of things worth dwelling on in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, and consider their alternatives. And I've listed these in your bulletin insert. Let's focus on what is true, not false, untrustworthy, or imagined. Whatever is noble, not shameful, twisted, or foolish. Whatever is right, not wrong, sinful, or rebellious. Whatever is pure, not tainted, coarse, or immoral. Whatever is lovely, not distorted, ugly, or offensive. Whatever is admirable, not gossipy, slanderous, or sarcastic. Whatever is excellent, not inferior, wasteful, or flawed. And whatever is praiseworthy, not objectionable, insulting, or evil. So my charge to you today is to rejoice, relax, and rest. When these principles become practices and these practices become patterns or habits in our lives, verse 7 will be fulfilled and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. God's dream of shalom will become your reality. Now next week our, will be our final study in the book of Philippians. I've really enjoyed this. I love the book of Philippians. And we'll be focusing once again on joy and resting. And we will explore looking within, looking around, and looking up. In a message titled, Living Beyond Your Needs. So please read Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 23 in preparation for next week's message. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that we can come to your word and it solves all of our problems. I know we'll still struggle, Father. I know that we will battle daily with anger and anxiety, but let us think on those things that you tell us to think about, written by the hand of Paul. When things and we struggle, let us go back to this list over and over again and think about these things. Then the peace of God will rule in our hearts and our minds as we stand in Christ Jesus. Help us to do this each day, Father. Even on the rough days, help us to come back to your word, to study these things, to think about these things. And then we rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. I pray that this message was a blessing and a time of learning from God's word. Thank you so much for allowing me to be your guide, your mentor, but most importantly, I am your friend as I serve you through the Wisdom Trek podcast and journal each day. And as we take this trek of life together, let us always live abundantly, love unconditionally, listen intentionally, learn continuously, lend to others generously, lead with integrity, and leave a living legacy each day. I am Guthrie Chamberlain, reminding you to keep moving forward, enjoy your journey, and create a great day every day. See you next time for more wisdom from God's Word.